Assalamu alaikum. Um, if you are asked, besides Quran and Sunnah, we've seen the equations of the math house. If you look at each of those tools, these are tools used to arrive at greater certainty. No, these are tools used where we don't have Quran, we don't have Sunnah, okay, what next? So some would say Ijma next. Some would say Ahad Hadith. Some would say Qiyas. No, and it's more, the one you are more certain can preserve either the objectives or the wisdom of the Quran and Sunnah becomes the next priority. Uh, and gradually it goes that way. From all you've heard, if you are asked what are the most important three tools besides Quran and Sunnah, what would your top three be and why? I'd like you to form groups. First row, just turn your chairs back and face the second. Third, turn and let's just go that way. So brothers, if you can turn and face the other side. So, of all the tools, of all the tools, what would you consider the most important three? If you are told there's no other, but you are to move into the future, any community, let me, let, me ask, uh, let me ask another question first, just so that uh, you understand one of the points I'm trying to make. What is the most important tool of a carpenter? In a carpenter's toolbox, what is the most important tool? Hammer. So? Ruler? Everything? What's the most important tool? <laughs> the empty box? It would use the measuring tape, the thing to prevent you from cutting the wrong length? Or would it depend on the job to be done? Okay. That if you knew what was required, then it becomes easier what tool becomes the most important. So if what is required is, oh, it's a loose nail, we just need another nail, oh, then we just need a hammer. If something is too long, <clears throat> probably need a saw. If it is where to cut, then probably a measure and tape or something like that. And so, <clears throat> just as we said before, your master chef thing, a mujtahid, unfortunately, doesn't find it easy to have all the tools. When they find themselves in a situation, then they decide what's the most relevant tool for achieving makasid in this context. The question I'm asking <clears throat> is a slightly difficult one because I'm saying forget about specific context. You're to move into the world of South Africa, whatever, and you're to go with two, sorry, three tools. Besides Quran, and Sunnah. What would be your top three tools? Discuss. We are five minutes. Let us get your next three most important tools. Inshallah. So top three and three. Sorry? Top three and then no, just top, no, just top three. Besides Quran and Sunnah, what are the what do you think would be the most useful tools for you here in South Africa? Bismillah. Five minutes. Okay. Um, I'd like to move round and I'd like each group tell me your number one tool. Okay, not the whole three. We'll start with your number one. Google. I say God. Okay, good. Google. Google. <laughs> good. Uh, so, let's start with this group and we'll move this way if you don't mind. Your number one. 
um, the number one, uh, the first one we chose was Orf. Orf. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Good. Next group. There was a consensus. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> no consensus, no non consensus. <laughs> Allow it. <laughs> Still deciding? Codification or an understanding of what is public benefit and human rights. Okay, so public benefit. Okay, good. Same thing? Okay. Istesan, good. So Istesan Maslaha again. This line? Istesan. Istesan. We said Istesan Maslaha and Kiyas, and then we have different uh, rankings of them. Thank you. One Istesan. Okay. <laughs> Next. Okay, here? Is the sun? Maslaha. Kias. Good. Ijma. Good. <coughs> now, what you will find is every tool has something it's trying to protect. Okay, um, usually things like Ulf. <coughs> Societies have survived with this Ulf for long. In other words, Ulf has usually already played a Maslaha role. Are we together on this? Yeah, that's why it's still there in the community. And that's why Sharia is not all that eager to just change people's culture. Now, somebody becomes a Muslim, must they change their names? You know, the Ulf at the time of the Prophet, just leave them with your names. Um, Stay with, so long as it was your ulf and your custom, and that comes down to even professional ulf. You know, um, certain etiquettes you have in your own uh, profession, your own guild, your own uh, uh, specialization, etc. The jargon, the all of that, uh, and you judge an ulf by how the ulf judges the ulf. Not you judge this ulf by another ulf. Um, you know this thing that sometimes the Indians or Malays, this sarong, that like uh, is a yeah. Uh -huh. Where I come from, um, I will not even be allowed into the mosque <laughs> with it on. Yeah, like you. I don't think I'll get out of my compound. They like something must be wrong with him. Catch him. <laughs> um, women dress like that. At the time of the Prophet, men wore Izar, the Prophet wore Izar, women wore Izar. It was, what, what do they call it, bisexual? Um, unisex. unisex, sorry for <laughs> You said if you wore it uh, in, in your local masjid, you'd, you'd be looked at, uh, but if, if a guest came and I came and I wore it, would it bother the local people? That was my question. Um, depends on where we were. If we were on a university campus where they've seen more variety, they would not have a problem. They would feel very uncomfortable with you being Imam. <laughs> um, they, they may want some clarity. Like there's somebody who's going to, somebody will ask like, what's, what's this? And I know it's their culture. Oh, okay. you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, this is why in my culture, the Ulf would say, don't dress like a woman. That's what the Hadith uh, says. Um, in another culture, it's not dressing like a woman. Uh, and trousers in northern Nigeria, trousers, that's men's clothing. Yeah, that's men's clothing. Women don't wear trousers. Um, so Pakistani women wearing trousers like that, you know, it took time for others to... Trousers called one doing house at. One don't matter, like it's like an oxymoron, like how can you have women's trousers? <laughs> I know. But um, uh, you do have with more globalization, more mixing of cultures, the need to be more respectful of that diversity uh, and to understand 
that in some cultures the difference between what's for men or what's for women is very nuanced. You know, uh, like in Western clothing, it's which side are the buttons, on the right or the left. You know, that determines whether it's a man's shirt or a woman's shirt. Um, or, you know, do you zip the trouser with your right hand or your left hand will tell you whether it's a men's trouser or a women's trouser. Like, unless you know that culture um, and you are a bit literate, it's easy to get very judgmental. You know, and to say, oh, you know, um, earrings are all for women. In some cultures. It's, I remember a class we were in and one Imam was like, there is no way a man would wear earrings. Yeah, in some culture, there is no, even your fitra. I said, you mean your fitra? You know, it was uh, very, like, it, it's impossible. Uh, so, again, it's very important when you meet any ulf that you respect it. Yeah. Be very careful about pushing Arab or Pakistani or Malay or Indian or Hausa or Swahili or, you know, any Urf that is already the majority, Islam has no problem with your Urf. The problem is when you take that Urf along with you and you go somewhere else and you're saying, this is what Islam says. Yeah. And that, that's the excess baggage that actually stops Islam from moving because people don't mind changing religion, but cultural apostasy? Mm. That's a bigger problem, you know. Allah created you shu'uba wa kabahil li ta'arafu. You created a nation, they know each other not to obliterate each other. But unfortunately, because you don't see what exactly is Qur'an and Sunnah, and even in the Sunnah, what is Urf? Yeah, even in the Sunnah, what is Urf? What do you make a big deal about? What do you insist? No, if you're becoming a Muslim, you should also. Because if you put all of it together, you find people becoming more resistant to accepting Qur'an and Sunnah. Why? Because you're insisting on something that even scholars have argued on whether it is Urf or not. Yeah, it's there. I just want to more clarification. Because, for example, maybe in other areas, you find that for those who are wearing their trousers and we should we regard it as a, an Urf or it's just an, a culture which other people, they, they're part of it. The moment it is a culture and people have no problem with it, it belongs to Ulf. When it comes to, remember the tree diagram, okay? Um, is something halal or haram? Or we look at the equations we had, okay? The premise of things is permissibility. Everything is halal, okay? In Ulf, everything is halal, except what is prohibited. So before we say prohibition, prohibition will not come from somebody else's urf. Okay? You don't use another urf to make haram of one urf. No, no, no. The haram, when you say urf is a source, it means our urf is going to be a source of our prohibition. Not our urf in Nigeria will come and stop people from wearing sarong or something here. Yeah. So when we say urf, we're talking of the urf of a place. Yeah, that is what, uh, when the Hanafis or the Malikis are saying you will uh, take Urf, or actually all of them in the Kawai will take Urf uh, as important, um, they're meaning the Urf of a place, which is really the Urf that has proven to be a Maslaha benefit. If, however, the Urf is causing injustice, etc., then we would, that's why in the ranking, Urf is not before Quran and Sunnah and clear Maslaha. Yeah, Maslaha would usually come before Urf because it must meet that, otherwise we will change culture. Or many cultural practices the Prophet changed when they were not uh, bringing benefit. Um, it's difficult to say which one is right, which is wrong. As you know, in the equations, um, they all differ on what would be uh, most important. Kiyas, because it is tied to text, is more restrictive. Yeah. So there are many issues that you will meet. If you can't do Kiyas, then you have to look at other tools. But the good thing about Qiyas is at least there's greater certainty. You know, why? You can tie it to an illa in a verse, you know, so there's the hikmah you're taking. So it's honestly difficult to say yes or no to any of these. Which is why in the equations of the mashabs, they all differ on which one comes before the other. Maliki will put maslaha after Amal of Medina, 
Um, most of them will take Ulf later, but if you look at Ulf as fulfilling Maslaha, then it will come earlier. So uh, there's no clear right and wrong uh, in this. Yes, sir. What's the understanding between hegemon and democracy? Consensus and the uh, uh, views of the majority. Okay. Consensus in Usul al fiqh, ijma was known as absolute consensus. It wasn't jabul, it's not majority opinion. It's consensus, no disagreement. The moment there was disagreement, they don't call it ijma. Yeah. Democracy is majority. Yeah, there's a minority that differ. Um, that's number one. Number two, democracy, when applied to a community, was not asking scholars, it was asking everybody. Mm. Yeah. Whereas when scholars talked about ijma, they were particularly meaning either ijma of Sahaba or ijma of Mujtahid <laughs> scholars, <clears throat> but it was more a meritocracy system where you're looking at those who are most qualified to say, have they got a consensus? If they have, then it is a source. If they don't, then it's like any other area of difference. On when growing up and you are going to, uh, they want to teach you safety rules, there is a maxim, which is like a summarized statement that they try to make you memorize to guide you when crossing the road. Can anybody remember that? Good. Look right. Are you sure? Yes. Yeah, this is the problem with you. Yeah, I get myself killed quickly. Okay. So yes, you look right, you look left, you look right again. Yes. It's not as simple as you look right and you cross. Why do you look left? There's always the left case, right? Yeah. There's always somebody who decided to go the wrong way. Okay. So it is better to say, look right, look left, look right again. Why? Because look right, look left, but just before you cross, maybe something came out when you were looking left. It's a very simple statement, but it is loaded with wisdom. In chemistry, when mixing acids and water, can you remember the maxim? Anybody? Water is water to acid. Good. You add acid to water, never water to acid. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. You can if it's a high. Uh, Volatile acid, you'll have an explosion. You can die. You can be like anything can happen. It's a very simple statement. Add acid to water, not water to acid, and they pump it into your head. When you go into the lab, don't argue too much against these rules. They're packed with wisdom. They can save your life. What scholars have also tried to do is find certain maxims from all the teachings of the Qur'an and the Sunnah, what are those maxims that these scholars have gotten? They have over a thousand four hundred maxims that apply to different contexts. But they package all of them under five major maxims. So these kawaid, they call them the kawaid al fiqhiyah al asliyah, you know, or al kulliyah. They are the they are the universal maxims of Islamic jurisprudence. They are actually Islam summarized in five sentences. Now, when you say squeeze all teachings of Islam, what will drop out? It's these maxims. Yeah. <laughs> so number one says, and you can check in your books, page what? 149. 149. Okay. So, on 150, <coughs> you have these maxims. So, the first one says, Al-Umur bi Umur 
means matters, issues, polity, pol policies, um, everything you're going to do. Al umur, the way you say in al amal, biniyat, al umur, bimakasidiyat. That matters will be judged as right or wrong based on the purposes that they fulfill. Al umur bimakasidiyat. So that's one way of understanding, which is, if you have an action, should we tick your action as good or bad? We want to first see what is the objective. What's the objective? Where is it heading to? Okay. This is the consequentialist type of thinking. That we will judge a thing based on what is it going to achieve. If it achieves benefit, we will say go ahead. If it achieves harm, we don't care how you describe it. Sadhu Zaria will come in and block it. Maslaha will block it. We'll find, we will stop anything that is going to cause harm. We will facilitate anything that helps us achieve the makasid. So that's one way of looking at it. Al umur bi makasidiha. Matters will be decided according to the purposes they fulfill. That's usually in mu'amalat. Usually in ibadah, al umur bi makasidiha mean that actions will be judged based on what was your internal objective, what was your niyyah, what was your intent. So this act of ibadah will be judged based on what was the intention. Show off, to serve Allah, to be seen, what was the intention. So it has those two meanings and they go together. So one, the action, we will decide whether the action is good by looking backwards. What is the intent? And then we will say, if the intention was good, then the action could be good. However, for the purpose of this maxim, most scholars of Usul and Kawaid are more concerned about this side of it. Our relationship with you and your own good intention. We don't care whether your intention is good. If it is causing harm, we will judge it by what it leads to. So al umur bi Um In other words, objective is very, very important. And later we will start looking more closely at what are the objectives that Islam is interested in achieving. We discussed some that Ibn Qayyim mentioned. Can you remember them? Justice. Justice. Wisdom. Mercy. Mercy. Benefit. Benefit. Also called maslaha. Sometimes the word maslaha and makasid are used interchangeably. They do have differences, we'll look at that later. Um, some would then mention some of the classical uh, makasid, the protection of deen and its enhancement, the protection of nafs or life and its enhancement, the protection of the mind or intellect and its enhancement, the protection of family, whether ird or nasab or nasal, different words, but Ibn Ashur puts it as family and the protection and enhancement of wealth, property, belonging. The things will be achieved, we will describe them good or bad, based on whether they achieve this or not. If they create the opposite, we will stop them. Yes, sir. Uh, if a husband divorces his wife instead of anger or drunkenness three times, and then he regrets it later, so This is where, in usul, you will find differences of opinion. In Makasid is where you are starting to now triangulate. And you would say, for example, in Makasid, protection and preservation of family, this is another subject area, we'll come back there. Uh, Islam is interested in protection of family. And so where scholars differ, some say, no, 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 it's equal to three, he said it, we all heard him. Yeah, but he didn't intend. Is Islam biased pro-family or pro-divorce? Okay. If it is pro-family, then we will take the ruling that is more in line with the Makasid. Yeah. So, this is where, if you didn't care about Makasid and Usul and Kawaid, and you just went with Usul, this must have said, that must have said, and that's the kind of answer you would get. But, where scholars say, fine, so which one is right, which one is wrong? This one has a solid argument of the equation of all this 
scholars of this madhab and this one has another equation behind it and all this scholarship etc. Fine, so there are two views there. Let's look at the same topic from with another lens of Kawaii. Al Umur bi Matters will be decided based on their, what they want to achieve. If it's this unnecessarily breaking a family, if so, we will not support it. We will go with the opinion of those scholars that is more in line with the maqasid of family. Another maqasid, uh, another maxim. So, one, purposes, al-umur actions are decided based on the purposes that they fulfill. Or matters are judged by the objectives and, in, you know, uh, what they fulfill. The second is al that certainty is not overruled by doubt. What does that mean? Certainty is not overruled by doubt. What it simply means, you remember the diagram we had before? This one is complete doubt. This one is complete certainty. That if there's any piece of evidence, any two pieces of evidence, we go with the piece of evidence that is more in line with certainty over the one with less certainty. If we have two pieces of evidence here, A and B, which one do we go with? A. We go with A. So sometimes it is the one that is the preponderance of the evidence. Like even in law, you can't always have the truth beyond a shadow of doubt. That would be yakin. Then they have the truth beyond all reasonable doubt. That is them. Then they have the truth based on the preponderance of the evidence. It's still van, but it's not, it's not how I, it's not just shak, etc. In other words, you always move with the greater evidence. That's why usul exists. Why? We want to find any way which one has more evidence and we'll go with that one. That's why in triangulating between the usul, kawaid and makasid, any, any fatwa that is supported by all three we are more certain of it than a fatwa that is supported by just one. Any fatwa that is supported by Quran and Sunnah and Maslaha and Qiyas and Urf, etc., is stronger than the other interpretation that is Quran and Sunnah. Yes, you can have Dilala that is interpreted, but it's not supported by anything else. So, what scholars are saying here is that evidence matters. We can't operate on just superstition. We can't operate on just guesswork. No, we should do the necessary research and move in the line of greater evidence. So Al-Yakin La Yazulu is simply saying something that is of higher certainty cannot be overruled by something of lower certainty. Yeah, we should be evidence biased in every decision we make, not just in fiqh. These maxims summarize Islam. Yes, they are important in fiqh, but they guide the judge in every situation. And they guide us. These are tools for critical thinking. I'm just changing the vocabulary. The third one, Adarar Yuzal. Suffering, hardship must be removed. Must be eliminated. Yes. Anybody in a state of darura. Anybody in a state of hardship, you know, we must eliminate hardship. Um, poverty must be eliminated. Things that cause people to steal when on their own they wouldn't want to steal. We must remove all of these things. Illness can't pay. We must remove anybody and anything that you can describe as darura, or darar, we must eliminate it. And so we must, re you can't remove relative poverty, there will always be somebody poorer than the other, but the kind of poverty where people are in hardship, what they call absolute poverty or abject, that must be eliminated. So it, go it goes, uh, uh, I think uh, I read it as al-darurat to be al Is it is it the same? No, related, it goes to the next one. Goes to the next one. Yes. Um, 
The, the third one is al mashaka tajriba taysir al mashaka difficulty, calls for facilitation. Okay? And that is where the other... Now, these maxims have what you call children. You know, there are many other... There are many of them. But what we are dealing with is those universals. So, tied to hardship or constraint, mashaka, constraint, calls for facilitation. Or ease, or relaxation of laws. The people in the rural, so number one, the poverty, the poverty must be removed. But it takes time, right? Yes. Meanwhile, while we are busy trying to remove the darura, the people who are undergoing that difficulty, we have to relax some laws for them. Are we together? Yes. So this focuses a lot on the context. This mashaka tajribu taisir for the individual. Yeah, so you won't cut the hand of a thief. You will relax this law and that law, and we'll come back to this, inshallah, soon. The number five, Al-Ada Muhakkama. Ada, or Urf, uh, custom, has the weight of law, Muhakkama. It, you know, you, you make judgments on it. This is really, really important. Especially when it comes as a maxim. You know, a summary of a lot of how the Prophet acted. That he left Ada as, you just leave people's cultures alone if that's what they're used to. Yeah, don't start cultural imperialism and all of that when Allah, the, the variety of customs and cultures, that you get to know each other. In akramakum in the it is taqwa that makes you a better human being, not your hoof. Sorry. So, yes, cultural imperialism, I take that point, but also custom can also create hardship. It can also Absolutely. facilitate. Uh, oppression or can facilitate injustice. So, how do we, uh, what ethic underlies how Urf is utilized? What you don't want is contradictions. The moment custom, when they say Al Ada Muhakkama, it means custom that doesn't contradict Quran, Sunnah, Makasid, it's not harm creating. So yeah. the, if I can go back to the example, yeah. so the custom in German Hanafi madhab is that women should not go to the mosque and pray in the darkest corner of their home. How is that, respecting that wolf, beneficial? It's not called wolf. How is respecting that fatwa, faith, whatever you want to call it, beneficial? No, there, there's no... Um, that is not... Urf, that is a conclusion some have reached from their interpretation of Quran Sunnah. Urf is not Quran Sunnah. When you ask somebody, what's the basis of your Urf? He's not going to quote Quran and Sunnah. He's going to say, that's how we were doing and that's how our forefathers did it. Or in our profession, that, that's what is called Urf. Because people have taken a particular teaching from, say, a particular madhab, and they have been doing it, it doesn't become Urf. It's still the opinion of a mother, and you can challenge it with another opinion. Urf, when you ask where does Urf come from, Urf is not Quran and Sunnah. Yeah. The moment somebody is saying, oh, we got used to it, uh, it doesn't become Urf. It's slightly different. So if we look at, say, the uh, traditional nikah. Yeah. Uh, Wait, nikah marriage? Yes. Or nikah? Okay. So nikah as in the Arabian custom, so it was the existing custom, which was slightly modified. Uh, it, uh, it does not necessarily fit with maybe some of the ideals expressed in, say, the Quran, in terms of how a relationship, uh, a husband and wife relationship should be, in terms of mutuality. Whereas the Islamic contract is about, I pay you mahar, you sexually available, you, I pay you mahar, you obey. So custom and and the trajectory of the ethic of marriage, they don't quite sit together. How how does 
changing that custom to, you know, you, you hear what I'm saying? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, so, for example, for some, in their custom, mahar is a bride price. It's not a gift. You're buying something. That is ulf coming in. And that's why, like in some of the mathabs, like in Maliki, you are not buying sexual access. Why? She's also buying sexual access, if you want to use that. They're looking at it as a partnership. This is a gift. I am coming into this partnership business with rights and responsibilities. And you are saying yes to certain rights and responsibilities of yours too. If I default on any of my responsibilities, it's called nushus, and it's a basis for divorce. If you default on any, it's nushus. It's just like business partnership. Of course, marriage is more valuable. It's not like business in and out as I want, etc. And so if you look at from the paradigm of the Quran and Sunnah, it's looking at it as a partnership business, not a sale, not buying, selling. Yes, you do have those who would like to look at it as a buying, selling, and you see it in some of their kiyas, but that is where you correct that. It is if you take it that is what Islam teaches, then you have a problem because you've already assumed that is the Islamic structure. Where, however, you find somebody has actually taken that structure, that it is viewed as buying, selling. Because if it was buying, selling, then the mahar would be the value of, would be even more valuable. It would be, okay, how much is a human being? You know, how much is a slave, uh, if you could find one? Um, but then how much is a free person? It would even be God knows whatever. Um, it was never understood to be so. Not by the Prophet now, if some scholars have come from it, come to it from that perspective, then it is to correct that no, it is not like that. But point being, um, because a particular practice has become common, uh, common, uh, and everybody is doing it, it doesn't become urf if they believe that this is our practice of religion. Yeah, uh, then it's not urf. Urf means those things they were doing that are part of cultural, customary practices, not Quran and Sunnah. But those become tied to attitudes and, uh, and societal norms. So it's almost like you're separating what was customary and looking at how do you take what was customary and fit it with the trajectory of what the Quran and what the Usul is asking you. So simple for example is simply and this is why where you have problem on the usul side or the kawaii side we'll look at the makasid side. Okay? Is it fair? Okay? Is it just? If it's not and we can show injustice then we will challenge it. Even if it's an interpretation of the Quran or the Sunnah. Yeah. So you think there's space in the fit, in the way the, the, this works for us to be able to really look at um, conceptions of what a marriage is, or what a divorce is, or what a relationship is? Yes, you can really look through the lenses of how the Prophet saw it, how the Quran presents it. Yeah. So, so long as you are within the parameters that the Quran and Sunnah left, yes, you can approach it with your own cognitive wolf. You know, we're all influenced by our own cultures, and somebody comes, but this is how it is in our culture. Yeah, but we can discuss and we can start articulating things that we've taken for granted, assumptions we never knew we were approaching the Quran and Sunnah with, and correct. But this is where the discussion, the arguments, and the triangulation become useful because it, it highlights certain things that are not fair that have been taken as part of religion and if it is part of urf, easy to correct. If it is being presented as religion, easier to correct. Why? Because you're going to then, oh it's part of your urf, yeah. What's the evidence for it? If you say my forefathers, okay then, you know, we know how to approach it. If you say Quran and Sunnah, that's even easier. Why? We've got an usul to tackle uh, that. We, you know, it becomes uh, one where I'm not saying it's easy in the sense that people aren't entrenched in their own opinions. But if people are ready to be more objective, then it's easier to show that there's injustice being caused here and we should all be concerned about injustice to any. So, so 
Um, key point here, I don't want to spend too much time because we'll be coming back to some of these, but just to remember, um, when it says al umur bi makasidiha, or matters are decided according to the purposes or the intents uh, that they fulfill, this is based on so many verses of the Quran and Hadith. So many. When it says al yakin la yazul bi shak, certainty is not overruled by doubt, you must go for evidence, etc. This comes from so many verses of the Quran. You know, from Yakulhatu Burhanakum, from um, uh, avoiding dhan and whatever, tilka uh, amaniyuhum, avoiding wishful thinking. So many texts that this is a conclusion of a lot. And the same thing about removing suffering and any form of injustice and hardship, and, and you see it in the. Uh, Like all the mafasid, all the things that Sharia is saying, haram, you know, uh, don't this, don't that. Look at the harm that's at the end of it. Yeah. Look at the harm, especially in the areas of Mu'amalat. And al mashaka Tajibu Taisir, that people in a situation of constraint, it calls for rahmah, you know, Taisir, ease, facilitation, uh, etc. All the rules around Ruhsa and Azima on relaxing laws, uh, brother was quoting here, come under that. You now you're fasting, you join prayers, you are sick, you stop fasting, you're in your periods, you stop praying, you this, you that. Constraint calls for relaxation of laws. We will come back to this, inshallah, soon, to look at the types of constraints. What's a serious constraint? What do, what's, a, what a serious, what's a less serious constraint? And how do the scholars draw the lines? Uh, and then respect for custom. Uh, we see this in the practice of the Prophet um, So long as a custom fulfilled maslaha, it was good, it wasn't causing harm. You know, he wanted to uh, prohibit um, uh, sexual relations when you are pregnant, but it didn't cause problem for the Persian, so he didn't stop it. Um, somebody comes with an idea of digging a trench around Medina. Arabs never heard of that type of thing. It was, you know, unheard of, but it's a good custom, no problem. Uh, it solves problems. Um, most of the Arab customs on the issue of marriage, there were actually four different types of marriages in Jahiliya period. The Prophet annulled the three forms, allowed the only one, which is what we're doing. Okay. It, Islam didn't introduce this kind of marriage. It's been there, where you have agreement, you have your witnesses, you have a gift that is given, etc. These are, and Aisha narrates these uh, types of marriages and all of that. So there's respect for custom. We see it in the Prophet ﷺ and the way custom, uh, standing up was a customary way of showing respect. Customary way. I think for most customs, standing up is considered a way of respect. The Prophet didn't like people standing up for him, but he had no problem standing up for others. Why? This was humility on his part. A dead Jew was passing by, he stood up. And the Sahaba said, like, why are you standing up? It's a dead Jew. He said, yes, but what the person not a living, was the person not a soul? Yes, and he said, when you see that, do that. Uh, you stand up for and ask school the Sayyidu tell us about stand up for Ma'ad bin Jabal, I'm sorry, the other Ma'ad, Sa'ad bin Ma'ad, a uh, number of others. Scholars, however, sometimes differ. They take it that since the Prophet said, do not stand up for me, the way people stood up and gradually raised Caesars and Jesus and all that, etc., therefore it is haram. Others said, no, we have to look at the types of standing. What type of standing did the Prophet discourage or prohibit? What type did he do? What type is actually considered respectful thing to do? Uh, and so Ibn Rushd classifies standing into four types of standing. And the scholars again, go ahead. Yes, sir. Mr. Derek, just a practical example in South Africa, how would we regard the Nobola? We have the Mahar where there's a gift for the Mahar. In the uh, indigenous people of South Africa, they have a gift for the parents, which is called the bola, and sometimes it's quite uh, expensive. Now the person becomes a Muslim, and he and his wife are Muslim, but the parents still insist on the <coughs> gift. Uh, how do you view that? Um, you can don't I explain that as well. Can I explain? Yeah. Okay. It, it is not totally in, in that particular fashion. The E is part of the bola, which belongs to uh, the incumbent wife. It's called a mapega. It is like insurance. Should anything happen to the husband when uh, 
he is not there to take care, she will get, let's say, the cattle. She will get the milk for the, for the children. Uh, they can, uh, she can get a span of oxen, of, of, of these cows, to go into the field and all that. The gift which is given to the father is to see to it that you are a man. I used to take care of, of my daughter. Are you able to take care of her? But nowadays they have made it a bride price as if you are buying somebody. But the question of Lobola among us, it means we are extending relations, our relations. I'm going to be an uncle to all the children from the other side and brother-in-laws and all that. Especially among the Zulu. If you are a brother-in-law, nobody can touch you. <laughs> 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 Pay the Lobola, then you are. Anytime, you could be anybody. Nobody can dare touch you, and we call you with a special name. You know. No, but this is part of why Al Ada Muhakama. This is why, um, while there are general things, the Prophet discouraged um, high costs in marriage, even in Mahar. Even in Mahar. Um, and the blessed is the one that is easiest. But it never made it haram. But what is important is to understand why does a custom do certain things? You know, you, you have to ask, what's, what's the maslaha? Why, why, like, everybody wants his daughters to get married. Why make it impossible? So before you go ahead and start oh, condemning, etc., the need, which is why in areas of Ulf, Actually, generally, this area of Ijtihad, muftis were never outsourced. Yeah. You don't get a mufti from somewhere, come and give fatwa here. No, you want somebody who understands the ulf, he's the one to give the fatwa on things. He's the one to say, this part of our custom has to change. Why? He fully understands it. Otherwise, you tweak one side, you think you solve the problem, you create another one. Yeah. So, um, really, I think he is saved me there, but this is the kind of thing where on issues to do with respecting custom, before you conclude a customary practice is unfair or contrary, get somebody who understands the custom properly, who understands the Sharia, understands the Magasid, and then you look, is it really um, a harm? Or, yes, it is harmful, but actually the benefits are greater than the harm. So when you meet many Arab scholars today, why are you in the Arab world? The cost of marriage? You're like shooting up. In the Hanafi Shafi school, it's interesting. So somebody who, when I was studying in Jordan, we had a, a guy who worked in the kitchen. He was getting married, and he was going to pay 3,000 Jordanian dinars. At that time, one Jordanian dinar was about three US dollars. You know, like that was money. I'm looking at you, cook, 3,000, you know, I'm like, okay, what's going on? How do you get this money? He said, no, all I need is 1,000 to get married, but I promise 3,000. If I divorce her, I have to go and get the other 2,000. <laughs> so you're kind of like, okay. So I meet the guy who's a, I meet a security guy, meet the security guy, and I said, you have doctors? Yes. Now somebody like the other guy, I said, he's getting married. Why would you charge something like 3,000 for marriage? And at that age, you know, you're more Quran, so now, uh, little respect for Urf. Uh, when this is, he said, you know what, yeah, in the past it used to be cheaper. Now with these people on all the television they're watching, they go, another girlfriend, another whatever, before you know it, they dump your daughter. So you have to cook them. <laughs> uh, and like, I mean, it's unfortunate, uh, but also you look at the reality in which some, uh, yeah, they make the marriage easy, but they put these hooks um, that they feel, again, this is an area of uh, debate. Is that really the best customer? Is that really the best way of uh, protecting marriages, you know, because of you've been hooked with having to go and get money? Um, as opposed to the mawadda and rahma that the Quran puts as what marriage should be characteristic of. Yes, yes. So I'm going to come back to your point on sexual access and the money thought of it not being by sexual access. So it's a general 
to have people that do not have any sexual access. So the notion of uh, or, or not accepting the concept of marital rape in the Hanafi school of thought, the Hanafi matter, uh, I, I want to understand the usage of mahasid in this context of force, in, you know, for sexual availability, and how it applies or how it works with the idea that it is unethical but it's not illegal. I can't understand it being sunnah, so what is it? Um. Terms like marital rape are new terminologies. Yes. Now, traditionally, rape is not used within the marital uh, context. And so for some, it's like marital rape. Like, it doesn't register. If, however, you look at the kawaid, one is a darar you know, harm must be eliminated. Yes. Okay? Is forced sexual relations anything to do with the sunnah? Or is it contrary? It's contrary, like nobody argues about it. The problem is when you start using certain terminology that, wait a minute, are you saying this is equivalent to that or is that what you're saying? Um, it's not difficult for, scholars would agree that if you hit your wife, like in Maliki for example, um, if you hit your wife, that is a basis for her to get a divorce. If you insult your wife's parents, not even your wife, you insult your wife's parents, it's a basis for her to get a divorce. Okay? She didn't get married with her having that right or you having that right. Forced sexual relations for the wife may be a hundred times more painful than even hitting. So, for example, in the Maliki school, on the issue of rape, we're not talking of domestic, just rape, how to classify it, and what is the fine to be paid. Uh, Ibn al-Arabi al-Maliki, the Qadi Maliki scholar, <coughs> says, rape is definitely under Hiraba, because they are using kias. They don't say it is like zina, and you need four witnesses or three witnesses, or sorry, four witnesses and all of that. It says like Hiraba, which is like highway robbery, but because a woman would prefer, many women would rather you rob them of their property than you rape them, the punishment should be the highest level of punishment for Hiraba, which is death sentence. Uh, and some would recommend a more gruesome, uh, you know, amputate the leg, opposite limbs. Uh, uh, and they differ on that. But the key point being rape, whether done within family or not, is wrong. How it is defined, how it is determined, even in other legal systems, is an ongoing debate. And it is for Muslim scholars to have that debate of, okay, how do you determine when is it considered abusive? Um, it's just like when you say you hit your wife. Okay. If you hit a woman, just a woman anywhere, you hit a woman who is selling things or begging or whatever, she takes you to court. The judge will make a judgment, stazir, or uh, up to the discretion of the judge, what type of fine you would pay. Some put it under this So you just hit a woman, they will take you to court, and the judge will decide whether you should be beaten in a similar way or you should be fine, the judge will decide. So let's say this court case goes on and the judge says, okay, you will pay X number of rounds for what you, a thousand rounds, for example. Few months later, you see the same girl and she smiles and you smile and you talk and a few months later, you get married. <laughs> now in marriage, she does the same type she did before marriage, and you hit her again. Does marriage reduce any of her rights for protection? No. Not at all. She can take you, she'll take you back to the same court. This time, the judge is not going to, the judge, like, 
The judge actually, view, but wait a minute, you're supposed to be her protector. Now she needs protection from you, then you have a right for divorce, number one. Number two, this is a repeat offense. Yeah, this is a repeat offense. And the judge decides, okay, what will be the more appropriate punishment so that this doesn't happen again? So if she says, no, I don't want a divorce, but let him be punished, or have a restraining order, or whatever it is, this is tazir, tazir, left, left to the discretion of the judge. The problem we have in many Muslim societies is that societies does not cater for the training of judges to be competent in handling these type of issues. So they don't have practical issues, they don't debate it. It just becomes one way, it's just a theoretical discussion. So what does Islam say about this? No. So there's no debate on the issue. So it's just, oh, somebody says, uh, oh, Quran says, Fadri Buhunna, you can beat them. Oh, but that one, Gairmo Barri. And what well, beating is not part of the Sunnah. Oh, but if it's beating, but that one in this Mazhab means, and just theoretical. Um, so I'm getting more and more conscious of time. You will please forgive me for just moving on. Um, so these maqasid, <coughs> if there's an issue, you can look at it from the usul perspective. You can look at it from the kawaid, the legal maxims uh, perspective. And you can look at it from the maqasid perspective. What are the maqasid? We're on page 193. <clears throat> Very briefly, Makasid refers to the objectives, the higher intent. What is Sharia trying to achieve? What's the end of all of these injunctions? So what some scholars did, according to Imam Muhammad al-Ghazali and others reiterated the similar point, that when you ask yourself, everything that is haram, why is it haram? What's it trying to protect? When there's a punishment for something, why is there a punishment? What are we trying to prevent people from doing when we punish them for something? Okay. When you punish people for theft, what are you trying to prevent or protect? When you punish people for zina, what's the big deal? What are you trying to protect? So those are the makasid, the things that Sharia is trying to protect. Or achieve. And they classify the Makasid into two main categories. One, the benefits that it's trying to accrue, what they call Jabul Masad, you know, accruing of benefits, and Darul Mafasid, prevention of harm. Prevention of Mafsada. Mafsada is just the opposite of Masla. Benefit, harm. So here we have a twinned approach of enjoining right and forbidding wrong of wanting good, but realize there are some of the things that you have to prevent if you're going to achieve good. You know, you want to help a poor person, you have to prevent certain forms of exploitation, for example. Uh, you want to enhance life through better nutrition, you will have to prevent diseases and uh, pollution of society or, you know, streets, water, this and that, etc. Um, you'd have to help cure disease, not just enough to give good quality food. So you will enjoy right, you will forbid wrong. So, what they try to do is look at the major themes, and we've already touched on this briefly before, the preservation and promotion. So there's that positive side, the preservation, uh, promotion, uh, and there's the negative side, which is the prevention of the harm that undermines Amakasir. So there's deen and religion, there is life, there is mind, there is family. Now under family you have posterity, you have ird, uh, lineage, etc. So even I should just put them all, you know, this is family. Uh, and you have wealth and property. How are we sure that this is an objective of Sharia? How are we sure it's not just we like to protect deen and not that Sharia has that objective? How are we sure that preservation and promotion of life is a maqasid of Sharia? Not just we think it's good, like who wouldn't want a better life? Does that make it a maqasid? And so in your material, you will find a list <coughs> of all that went into scholars concluding that these maqasid we are sure are the maqasid of Sharia. 
There are some universal ones that they will add, like justice. Like freedom from oppression or liberty. Like Rahma or compassion. There are other things like respect, some put it under life, I'll put it separately, animals and their own right to life and comfort. You can't just be cruel to animals just because they're animals. Um, part of the Sunnah of Prophet Nuh when there was an environmental problem was to save species of biodiversity. I mean, this is just modern language used. Prophet said if the day of judgment was to find you taking a seedling to go and plant it, and the day of judgment was to come, finish planting it. Okay, what's the big deal about that? Why are you cutting trees during Ikram? What's the problem? We just, we just carry on. Uh, and so you find restrictions here and there in various aspects of life, and scholars bring these down. Animals, environment, uh, peace as an objective. Of course, long-term object, uh, peace and forgiveness also. Uh, but you could put that under Deen and Taqwa. So this is all various ways of classifying. Um, but how are we sure that we should preserve Deen and protect Deen? So many verses in the Quran about Dawah and the promotion of Deen. So much on the prohibition of Shirk. So much on Ya Ya Nasu Wudu Rabbukum You know, worship your Lord, uh, prayer, fasting, all of those things that help improve your relationship with your Creator and your fulfillment of your purpose. So they have no doubt, definitely Sharia wants us to preserve and promote Deen and building mosques and uh, all the things surrounding Deen. How are we sure Sharia is interested in the preservation and promotion of life? Similar. We have verses of the Quran saying to save the life of one person is like saving humanity. There's a punishment if you kill somebody. So it's not as if it doesn't matter. Yeah. It clearly does matter. There is a punishment uh, for murder uh, in Islam. And even if it is forgiven, there is blood money. And even if you, like it was an assassin, it's taken as a, like you can forgive, but the state has not forgiven. So the state will decide uh, what to do in that case, even if you forgive the murder. Why? Because from the Maslaha point of view, the state looks at it, this is a guy who's dangerous to society, you know. Just because he is rich, whatever, he could play the blood money, means he keeps on, you know, driving his car the way he wants. Um, in other words, life matters. Uh, uh, the issue of uh, health care and taking medicines, and for every disease, Allah has also had the qadr of there being a cure. Um, and the importance of security and fighting to defend others, and that if you fight in defense of whatever, you die as a martyr. You know, the childbirth, just bringing another human being and you die in childbirth, you die as a shahida, you die as a martyr. Uh, and the taking care of the sick and all that issue surrounding preservation of life, uh, providing food, health care, all of that. Each of these has major professions around them. Preservation of the mind and protection of the mind. And so the prohibition of narcotics and intoxicating substances. Uh, but the enhancement of the mind also of ask those who don't know. Uh, sorry, ask those who know if you don't know. Seek knowledge. Uh, is far to seek knowledge. Uh, and so when you look at all of these from the Quran Sunnah, uh, practice of the Prophet and the Sahaba, um, there's no doubt Islam is pro-family. You know, the prohibition of zina, the discouragement even of divorce, and the various rights that go in, and the distribution of inheritance starting with family before going out. Um, and all the rules on family law, big fat sections surrounding marriage and family and uh, avoiding conflict and rights and responsibilities. Preservation and promotion of wealth. And the prohibition of riba and gambling and any form of cheating or fraud and cutting down on issues to do with speculation and um, what again stealing uh, and zakat for distribution of wealth and all of that. So you have that people's belongings; they have a right to it, but it should be protected. There's punishment if you try to take somebody else's thing without. There's, if you check in Islamic in the books of fiqh. 
the fattest section of books of fiqh is what? Finance. Kitab al exactly, finance. That's the big fat section, you know. Uh, Islam has a lot to say. Why? Because a lot of our everyday life is tied with building wealth so that we grow, so that we take care of our families, preserve ourselves from death and all the other things, and are able to come and spend time here talking about usul, etc. Um, and so, and you have, you know, all sorts of systems uh, in place. Uh, and the same thing with justice. How are we sure Islam teaches justice? Even against your own self, against your family, against this, and you stand for justice. It's one of those non-negotiables. Ibn Taymiyyah was quoting earlier scholars where he said, Allah will protect a community that stands by justice, even if they are not Muslims. And Allah will not protect a community that govern themselves by injustice, even if they are Muslims. Allah is not your fan. You know, it's not like supporters club, you win, you lose, I'm with you type of uh, thing. Um, Allah is with Muttaqeen, Allah is with those who are just, Allah is with, like he doesn't go, he's already told you, you submit to his will, it's not the other way around. You know, like Allah is not a Muslim. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, he follows a particular madhab, but you know, it's like, he goes in line with you. No, he's humble <laughs> Allah, you know, you kind of bring him down to your own narrow, uh, we are God's chosen people, he's with us. That's exactly what the Jews said, you know. Uh, he is with us and, you know, so we can look down upon others, have this little spiritual or big spiritual arrogance and, you know, we're guided, you're lost and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you don't want the bad surprise on the Day of Judgment. So it's good to understand Allah. Uh, and the same thing with the others. Because of how well established these are from the Quran and the Sunnah, just as the way the various five Kawaid are from the Quran and the Sunnah, just as usul, the various things established from Quran and Sunnah, and you can see your material from all of that. Each one of these is a solid field on its own. And the moment there's a contradiction, it calls the society or its scholars to put the brakes on and look at an issue carefully. If any of your fatwas or understand from Kawaii and Usul are undermining compassion, justice, the mind, life, it's undermining this, yeah, something is wrong. Yeah. Even the Kawaii will say, Al Umur bi you know, matters will be decided upon what they and if they are not fulfilling this, what are they fulfilling? Mafsada? But part of the objectives is removing this from the usul. Maslaha is are supposed to achieve makasid. Al umur bi makasidiha. Al darar yuzah. So you have this triangulation where we are able to get the usul of the makasid. You know, when you say makasid is built on what? It's built on Quran and Sunnah. Okay. The kawaid, what's the usul of the kawaid? Where do they come from? They are also built on Quran and Sunnah. And the usul of fiqh are also built on Quran and Sunnah. You know, when you say qiyas and maslaha and all of these, these were used by the Prophet and the Sahaba. So they have their groundings. <clears throat> and so these play this very important role of triangulation. Yeah. The moment there's a problem somewhere, please slow down and do some good research. Yeah. It means you're either in a different urf, or times are changing, and it's time, you know, scholars will say we change in situation, change in what? Change in fatwa. Yeah. We can't. You sense this is no more fair. Maybe it was okay last year, but we're beginning to sense it is creating a problem. Then you have to go and do what's a new ijtihad that will make sure you do not have conflict between Kawaid, Makasid, and Usul. The lesson 37 is looking at the application of Bakasid among the Sahaba and how, and we've discussed some of this before, um, moratorium on Hudud by who? Umar, uh, when it wasn't going to achieve Bakasid. Yeah. So it's not. Is Umar going against the Quran? Um, yes, Quran says you cut the hand of a thief, but all we learn from the Quran is Mashakatatul Taisir, that hardship calls for the relaxation 
of the laws. In other words, the same Sharia is the one telling you you don't apply it in this context. Yeah. And so while we, we want to protect property by cutting the hand of a thief, in a situation where you are not protecting property, people are driven to steal. This is just undermining their ability to work. This is just undermining especially ability to work. And this is another point. These makasid are all interrelated. You know, some try to put a hierarchy. So which one is more important than the other? Um, if you undermine one, you undermine most of the others. So it's difficult to say, so which one is more important? Um, you can lose your life in defending your wealth and you're called a shaheed. You can lose your life in defending your deen. You can do shirk to stay alive. But since it didn't come from your heart, it's accepted. Allah says there's no sin on the person who is driven to do things due to the ruler. Um, you can protect your... So all of these are important. If you undermine wealth, are we going to... Un will we end up undermining life? Yes, yes we will. Yes, we will. You know, uh, people will be dying just because there's no wealth to pay for hospital bills and this. If you undermine the mind and education, will you undermine anything else? Yeah. Yes, go to, an edu go to a place where the schools aren't operating and see the kind of doctors you get. See the kind of ulama you get. You know, see the kind of family life. You know, um, difficulty to make well, difficulty to ensure justice if you don't have sufficient educated people in key positions. In other words, all of these, this is very important, uh, protection of the mind. Because it's when that one is preserved, then you can have your fukaha. Then you can have the fardu kifaya, all these other professional responsibilities of doctors, of agriculture. You know, we don't look at jobs like uh, medicine and teaching and farming and healthcare as just professional dunya roles. They are achieving matasid. These are the objectives of the deen. When you go as a doctor or as a pharmacist or as a whatever it is, that is deen in action. It's actually called a fardu kifaya. If you want to know whether your job is fardu kifaya, hypothetically, just ask yourself, what happens if everybody in your job were just to stop working? Just shut that job down. People who clean garbage, okay, just stop working for one month. What would happen? Society Sorry? Society will collapse. Yes. You will get epidemics that will rival armies. You know, yeah. Cholera will, cholera will wipe out, typhoid will wipe out more people than an army would wipe out. Society will enter the rura. Adara Yuzal, it is fard to remove the, the rura. But since you don't need everybody to remove that darura, you just need a few, that fard is a kifaya, it's a fardu kifaya. It's a fard that is fulfilled by some, not everybody. It is if we don't have anybody fulfilling it, then it is treated like fardu ayn, everybody you are responsible for making sure we have enough people to solve this problem. So don't look at your professional jobs when you are fulfilling any of these as if it doesn't really matter, it matters a lot. On Ibadah, many of the scholars didn't like talking about the maqasid of acts of Ibadah, acts of worship. They preferred to talk about the hikmah or the sir or the, you know, the secrets behind worship, the benefits of worship, but they didn't like talking about this is the reason why. They would generally be able, they would usually concede that worship is to improve your relationship with Allah. So there's a taqwa. <clears throat> benefit since Allah also puts Ya Ya Nasu Guru Rakhmatullah Deh Alakafum Aladdin Amin Kablikum La Allakum Tatakun. You know, in Kutub Alaykum Siyam Guru Maktub Aladdin Amin Kablikum La Allakum Tatakun. You know, in Hajj for the Zawadu and the Hayr Zadi Taqwa and all the things about uh, acts of ibadah and Taqwa. So they're comfortable enough to say yes, that is an objective, but that we don't say that is the only objective. And so when it comes to acts of ibadah, they usually 
agree there is benefit because it's not benefiting Allah. But then why is Allah interested in us doing ibadah if he doesn't benefit? He wants us to do ibadah because he cares. Okay, so there's a benefit in zakat. There's a benefit in hajj. To my spiritual growth, to my psychological growth, to my community. There's a benefit in congregational worship. There's a benefit in this. So some scholars, and you will find Shah Waliullah Dahlawi in his book, uh, Conclusive Evidence, Hujat uh, al-Baliga, um, goes into this. Imam al-Ghazali, there's a book, Inner Dimensions of Islamic Worship. A number of scholars who have gone into uh, this subject area. So they recognize they are, but they don't usually use this vocabulary for discussing those. They talk about the benefits of worship, not the reasons for worship. I know it sometimes sounds so bad. On the area of uh, Makassid, uh, I'm getting very conscious of time. Um, we will, I think you will find it interesting, lesson 39, which looks at the levels of why. You know, why do you do this? Because why? 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 You know, so why do you stop at the traffic light? Because of the law. Why is there a law? Because it wants to protect harm. Why should we still stop? Because we believe in justice. So gradually you move from laws to the benefit of the maslaha and the makasid, or you could use them interchangeably. So the subject of makasid is really looking at those levels of why. And it's very important to recognize that non-Muslims usually will not disagree with you on makasid. Okay? This is common ground. Jew, Christian, atheist, everybody will usually respect most of these. Where they differ is what laws do you use to protect each of these. Okay. Uh, so, but for Dawah, it is really, really useful to study Makassar because for many non-Muslims, many young Muslims, many young Muslims, they want to know why. They'd like to see Allah's Rahmah and Hikmah in all these injunctions. So you should, please, find time to be able to link a Haram to a Makassar, a Fard to a Makassar. People begin to appreciate the deen. It makes sense. You know, it's not just blind faith, I'm just doing it because I know I can actually see the benefit and this is, um, you know. When you know the benefit of something, you know why it is good for you. You can know how to market it better. When you yourself don't know how it's beneficial, then how do you know when it's benefiting you? How do you make it benefit you? The The last topic we'll look at is the regulating of usul by Makassi. <laughs> um, um, that, that's the thing about one day courses. Yeah. Um, if we could look at uh, from page 219. <laughs> Um, what you find there is the concern for consequences, differentiating means from ends in Sharia. Um, and again, we'll look at this, but the need to have at the back of our mind, the way we have with um, Sadhu Zariya, okay, Sadhu Zariya is a prohibition of means. It's prohibiting something that is a means or ending in something else. So some things are. Are means. So some things are haram because they lead to other things. Some lead in a major way, some lead in a minor way. Some things are haram, they are the haram itself. Okay? Intoxication is haram in and of itself. But then carrying alcohol and selling alcohol and selling even grapes to somebody who consumes, the, uh, makes it, etc. These are haram of means, but they are haram because of where they lead to. Zina is haram, but all the means to zina are also considered haram. However, there's haram of the ends, the mafsada itself, or the haram of the makasid, and there's the haram of the wasail, those means that lead to haram. It is important, and this is on page 211, that diagram there, is simply telling you everything that has benefit has harm also. Okay? Everything with benefit has some harm. So before you start saying, oh, this leads to this, you have to weigh the harm and the benefits. Most domestic murders, it's knives. 
You don't say, since knives are used for killing in the home, let us ban the sale of knives. Most people don't kill each other with knives. Okay. So while this is harmful, the benefit for kitchen purposes, benign purposes is greater than the harm. So the existence of harm is not enough to say, therefore you will bring Sadhu Zaria in to say, block it. On page 223, there's a diagram there that shows on the x-axis, on the lower level, certain things that will, they will occur rarely, so rare occurrence, and then they can have probable occurrence, and highly probable, and then almost certain to occur. Before you say something is haram, even if it causes severe harm, it has to be highly probable or almost certain that it will happen. So as we said earlier, just because it is probable for or, or it is possible for a woman to be raped on her way to the mosque. When last was a woman raped on her way to the mosque here? Can't remember. It happened at the time of the Prophet but that's not a basis for a new law of, okay, uh, women no more going to the mosque. Yeah, Prophet actually had clear injunctions, do not prohibit the female servants of Allah from going to the mosques for their prayers. So it's not enough to just say, it is probable that there could be harm. You want a higher level of certainty that it is most likely going to be harmful. Then you come in with Sadhu Zariya. The reason we're mentioning this is because Sadhu Zariya is a very commonly abused tool. Yeah. Every little thing, oh, we could redo. What if? What, a lot of what if, you know? Uh, uh, which is why empirical studies and shura consultation with experts of the area, you know, they really need to really be careful because Sadhu Zariya is a very human tool. Yeah, it's our own assessment and context change. Uh, and to look at other societies, you know, what if? You allow this. The Prophet would look at what happens in Persia and decide, no, let it go. Why? It didn't create a problem there. We can't make prohibitions of just what if, what if. On page 227, you have that diagram there. On 228, you have a continent. There are, you know, you've got these haram of the means. You've got haram of the ends. Sometimes there's an overlap. There are some things some people, like scholars, are not like, is this a means or is it an end? So you've got those differences. Then, of course, there's here, Makru, and then there's in between the Makru Tahrimi that the Hanafis would bring. So you can actually have from disliked and discouraged but tolerated to disliked and discouraged to haram of the means to haram of the ends. Usually, if you hear Kabahir, major sins, they belong to the ends. Yeah, or they are very close to those ends. Why is this important? Because the maqasid are classified, the maqasid are classified according to how serious they are. So um, the ruriyat are those absolute necessities. Um, we must achieve them. And anybody in whose the ruriyat have been taken falls into a situation of the ruriyat. Um, so, when people are in Darura, or let me put a simple equation, the more difficult your situation, the more concession Sharia will give you. Okay? If you are not in problem, there's no ruksa, there's no linear. Like you can, uh, I, I, I want to eat some pork because I'm hungry. What's your situation? Any alternative? Yeah. No? No alternative? Sorry, everything is okay with you. Yeah. Alcohol, everything is okay and all of that. Um, if everything is okay, you are in the Tahsini situation, you are comfortable, there's no concession. If you start getting into Haja, concession start. If you get in Darura, they open the gates. Yeah, we don't want you to die. So yeah, eat the pork, eat the whatever it is, just don't die. Yeah, and don't get into yeah, don't, don't get in that situation. When however you are in Haja, not yet Darura. When a society is in Haja, it is treated like the ruler. Why? Because they are on the brink. Somebody is going to get into the ruler. Haja, you cause relaxation of laws in Haja so that people don't move in the Darura direction. You, you know, get them out of that. Let them go back to Tassim. When somebody is in Haja, so number one, 
When a community is in Haja, it is treated like a Darura. Okay. Um, when an individual is in Haja, haram of the ends remain haram. Haram of the means become permissible. Haja. So a Sahabi, for example, lost his nose in fighting. It's from Jahili. He put a silver nose on, but it was irritating the skin and smell. He asked the Prophet, can I put a gold one on? And the Prophet allowed him. He's not in the rura. Gold is usually haram, but it's the haram of the means. Another Sahaba was allowed to wear silk because he had, you know, skin uh, ill. He's not dying. Um, but if you are in Haja, and there are many other, you can read more about it, Haja allows you to relax laws that deal with haram of the means. Haja can allow taking alcohol from one place to another. It will not allow you to drink the alcohol. Haja can allow you, a patient, to be seen by a doctor. She wants a mammogram or a cervical cancer test. She's not in the rura, but she's in a state of Haja and fear. She may end up in the rura and actually have breast cancer or whatever. Diagnosis doesn't belong to the rura, it belongs to Haja. But exposing the aura is normally haram, but it's not haram in and of itself, it's haram because it could lead to zina. So when faced with Haja, haram of the means becomes permissible. Of course this is where there's no alternative. And all we're saying, there's no alternative. And when scholars differ on a topic, if there's a debate among the scholars, is it halal, is it haram? For a person in Haja, they will let the person uh, go with the easier option. So when scholars are differing on a topic, Haja is used to allow the easier opinion. Yes, it will have to etc. This is important because there are many rulings, many rulings in Sharia, that unless you understand the Haja of the community, you will not understand the Fatwa of the Mufti. Yeah. What people will usually do is just go with the hukum. The hukum is a normal judgment. How can you say remove hijab because people are afraid? Yes, but in usul, when, uh, when haja affects a community, it's treated like a darura. They will say, yes, remove the hijab. Why? Hijab is a, removing hijab is haram, but not of the ends. It's a haram of the means. No. So please, we don't have time for this, but they need to really be careful when scholars in a particular place are giving fatwas for their context, you don't know how, all you know is hukum. Oh, but Quran and Sunnah says that you don't know what is the context, who is the patient, what's the situation, um, how many people is it affecting. Uh, so need to appreciate uh, nuance when it comes to difference of opinion. Um, to conclude, scholars differ for many reasons in fiqh. They differ because of their different equations. We've discussed that. They differ because they differ in what to do when there is apparent contradiction in the text. Some will say, oh, we'll do Tarji and take what we feel is stronger. Others will say, we'll do Nasik or Nonsuk, and they will say, this is an abrogated. Another will say, no, we must strive to do jump. We must try and reconcile, you know, triangulate, reconcile all evidence, which is most difficult, but that's the most permanent. Uh, that's, the most, that's the strongest opinion where apparently conflicting texts are resolved through conciliation of all evidences. Um, and they differ because of the contexts they are dealing with. Uh, even the same scholar will change context and change position. What do we do when scholars differ? <coughs> Unfortunately, even scholars differ on what to do when scholars differ. <laughs> uh, not very helpful. But no, it is helpful in some ways. Um, if you are knowledgeable about the principles, etc. Scholars will say, where scholars differ, then you do the digging and see which one do you think has the strongest evidence. Okay, so that's one option. They're all in your book. Uh, one option. Another option, especially for people in leadership position, scholars will say you go with Maslam. You go with the one that achieves the, what's in the public interest. Yeah. Because if you say scholars have differed, so this is a scholarly view, this is a scholarly view, yeah, which one is in line with Makassi? Sometimes, especially if your case will go to court, they will say, go with your mathab. Yeah. Especially if that's the mathab of the land. Where I live, it's Maliki mathab. In another place, it's Shafi in Malaysia. In another place, it's Hanafi, etc. 
So if your case is going to end up in court, they would advise you go with the opinion uh, of, the, uh, of the legal system, especially if it will end up in court. Sometimes they will say go with the majority, the safety in numbers. And the scholars say, well, majority say this, etc. We've already discussed the challenge with that. However, there is still safety in majority. Some will say go with the opinion of the specialist, especially if it's a specialized area. You know, what do the specialists say on this topic? Some will say go with the opinion of the local scholars, the local scholars, especially in areas of Muhammadat, you know, socio-economic issues. Uh, uh, some will say go with the opinion that is in line with your urf, in line with the urf, you know, in the custom, what, what is less disruptive uh, of society. Some would recommend go with the opinion of the leadership. You know, if you've had a pact, you've got a constitution, this is what the leadership says, then go with the opinion of the leadership. You know, when Muslims went to Abyssinia, they respected the law of the land. Um, another is to go with which one is easier. Which one is easier? And this is based on the hadith where Aisha said, when the Prophet was given two options, they're all halal, he will choose the easier one. The Prophet said, yes, it will us. Make things easy for people, don't make them difficult. You know, for new Muslims, for people, let's make it easy. Um, lastly, you know, the Prophet you know, said, consult your conscience, even people give you fatwa upon fatwa upon fatwa, you're the one who's going to stand before Allah. You know, yeah. al you know, on the internal side, your actions will be judged by your intentions. So, what would be your intention? What are you going to meet Allah with? Maybe you'll do a combination. Okay, you will go with the majority of the specialists that are local scholars, for example. On this issue, you will go with a specialist. It's in Islamic finance. On a case of a new Muslim, you will go with what is easier. On a public policy thing, you will go with what is in line with Makassi. So, depends on the issue what to do, but there's that diversity. This brings us, fortunately, to the end. The topic I wanted to touch with, I just skipped when we were dealing with the second of the kawaii is the one on bid'ah and the two major ways the uh, scholars understand bid'ah uh, as innovation. Um, two minutes? Uh, on issues to do with on issues to do with ibadah, acts of worship. One group of scholars, so let's just say Ibn Taymiyyah, including Shatib, but let's just say Ibn Taymiyyah, says, in acts of worship, ibadah, everything is haram, except what is halal. And for it to be halal, you need Quran, Sunnah, and Sahaba. If you don't have anything from Quran, Sunnah, Sahaba, it is called bidah. And we claim that very simple. Yeah. Acts of worship, prescribed acts of worship, all they want is A, it's haram, except if you can prove it was done. Another group say acts of worship, whether acts of worship go with a general rule that everybody accepts for mu'amalat, mu'amalat social transactions. Okay? So mu'amalat and ibadah. Everything is permissible, except what is prohibited. And to make something prohibited, you need to prohibit it from Quran, Sunnah, Ijma, Qiyas, in short, Usul. Okay. So, for these scholars, Imam Suyuti, for example, when you bring something that to say after prayers, we do dua collectively, these ones will say, did the Prophet do it? No, then stop it. This is bid'ah. If you ask these ones, they will say everything is halal except what is haram. We'll do it. Why? To say haram, you know, remember istishab, uh, the presumption of continuity. Mm -hmm. Everything is halal except what is haram. You need evidence from the Quran or Sunnah to make it haram. These ones will add. When you say in ibadah everything is haram except what is halal, where did this Ka'idah, that in Ibadah everything is haram except for, where did that Ka'idah come from? Every Ka'idah must have its own roots. Okay. And they take it, Ubin Umar, etc., etc. Others criticize. 
They say at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, you had people who would innovate in ibadah. And the case would be brought to the Prophet ﷺ. Somebody recites Surah Al-Ikhlas after he has recited the various surahs, etc. So before going to Ruku, he will recite Surah Al-Ikhlas every time. So this Sahaba complaint brought to the Prophet, there's this gentleman, this is what he does. If everything was haram until halal, you don't need to bring it to the Prophet. You just say it's haram. But he did it. But what did the Prophet do? The Prophet didn't say, go and tell him it's ibadah. He shouldn't do anything unless I or the Sahaba, uh, unless I teach it. Prophet asked them, ask him why does he do it? And the answer came saying, he said, because it, the, it reminds him of our Allah, he loves it. And the Prophet said, tell him he will be with those whom he loves. Oh. Okay? <laughs> you had all this Hamdan Kathir and Taiba Mubarak and Fihi rising. Prophet didn't teach that Sahabi, he just did it on its own. Mm. So these scholars are saying, these Sahaba seem to be operating on the assumption that everything is halal, mm. except if it is haram. And there are those that are haram, the guys said I'm going to fast all every day and those who are going to castrate myself and you know, tajud all night, etc. And the Prophet said, no, because it contradicts something that's already a right of your wife or right of the body, etc., etc. In short, these guys are trying to protect acts of ibadah from excess baggage. That if you allow this, you're going to get all sorts of things coming into the deen. That's what they are afraid of. These ones are trying to stay loyal and not make haram without the prerequisite evidence. Unfortunately, the fight goes on. Yeah, and every maulud is another reason to break brotherhood, which they all agree is from the whatever, whatever. But what is important to understand is this is a product of ijtihad, this is a product of ijtihad. Okay, yeah. Uh, and we should respect that diversity, but life goes on. But it created a lot of kufar. That one of This one. Oh, that's it. We have made mistakes. I pray Allah to forgive me and guide us aright. Thank you for your patience. Sorry for taking so much time.